Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Obama gives Trump some going away gifts. We got that story, plus the robotic office space continues apace. But first, we'll dive right into a very futuristic story for our first New World Next Week for the year of 2017. And we want to welcome you all back and appreciate you taking the time off with us through the holidays. Researchers warn of fingerprint theft from the peace sign. Could flashing the peace sign in photos lead to fingerprint data being stolen? Research by a team at Japan's National Institute of Informatics, NII, says so, raising alarm bells over the popular two-fingered pose. Fingerprint recognition technology becoming widely available due to, uh, to verify identities, rather, such as when logging on to smartphones and tablets and laptop computers. But the proliferation of mobile devices with high-quality cameras and social media sites where photos can easily be posted is raising the risk of personal information being leaked. The NII researchers were able to copy fingerprints based on photos taken by a digital camera three meters away from the subject. Just by casually making a peace sign in front of a camera, fingerprints can become widely available, NII researcher Iso Achizen told the Sankei Shimbu newspaper. Fingerprints, fingerprint data can be recreated if fingerprints are in focus with strong lighting in a picture, he also told television. Now, James, I don't know that the actual research of all of this is out, but I do have a link to actually Isao's page on the National Institute of Informatics, and it has all of his previous research. So I imagine when it gets published, it'll be at that at the top of the list, James. So uh, they talk about ways to fight this, and maybe the one best way to fight it is to give it the give it the British style, James. Or I've got my own <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> I almost asked you why you had gloves on. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, I was thinking ahead. Yeah, um, we jest, but uh, I mean, honestly, how are you going to start protecting yourself when, of course, it's not just things in social media that you're posting yourself. It's the uh, cameras that are everywhere and tracking every move you make. Um, and there are already things going up. I mean, they've already banned the anonymous mask things in various places for various events and things because it could screw with their facial recognition software. So it just gets uh, crazier and crazier. And we've talked about it before, but let's reiterate it. Um, uh, these biometric uh, security features are exceptionally easy to, to, uh, to get around, to mimic, to, ma uh, to copy people's uh, biometric identity. And impossible for you to ever do anything about it. You can't change your fingerprints. You can't change your face. You can change your uh, you can change your password, but you can't change these biometric details. So uh, um, it's a stupid, stupid, stupid thing. If we were to believe that people are trying to implement this simply and solely for security purposes, i.e., to keep things safe and secure, but of course. I don't think that's what this is really about. It's about identifying you and coming up with the technology and gadgets to identify you anywhere, anytime, any place. And on that note, I think you probably have a follow-up story. I do, but even just what you're saying there reminds me, you know, we've gotten to the point now where when people's banking information is compromised, it's now gotten to the point where banks are like, yeah, it's okay, we'll refund you, everything will be taken care of. That's wildly different than, of course, the scenario we're laying out right there and what you just described. You can change some bank account info, but you can't change your fingerprints. Some of the related stories, one goes actually back to about three three years ago on Gizmodo. And this is straight up Blade Runner action, as they note even in the article. Hidden faces can be found by zooming into high-res photos of eyes. And we will include the link to the PDF of that identifiable images of bystanders extracted from corneal reflections. And they make the same note in there that the researchers from Japan make, James, and that it's basically, if you've got enough light, you can do it. The other related note is a really interesting one that tells a, a really bizarre, dark tale, but this is now the world we live in. Fugitive who evaded capture for 17 years, caught by the feds using their facial recognition technology. He stole the identity of a kid who died decades ago, but he was recognized with the digital database of the photo that he put on his passport. 
So as we continue to our second story on this episode 295 of New World Next Week, our first episode for the new year 2017, we hop over to The Guardian. However, James, we stay in your neck of the woods, and we are in some ways taking a bite from the Asia-Pacific perspective, with apologies to our buddy Brock West. Japanese company replaces office workers with AI. A future in which human workers, human workers, are replaced by machines is about to become a reality at an insurance firm in Japan where more than 30 employees are being laid off and replaced with an artificial intelligence system that can calculate payouts to policyholders. Fukoku Mutual Life Insurance believes it'll increase productivity by 30% and see a return on its investment in less than two years. The move, however, is unlikely to be welcomed, however, by 34 employees who will be made, James, I'm already seeing this as the word of 2017, redundant by the end of March. The system, of course, is based on international business machines, Watson Explorer, which, according to the tech firm, possesses cognitive technology that can think like a human, enabling it to analyze and interpret all of your data, including unstructured text, images, audio, and video. According to a 2015 report by the Nomura Research Institute, nearly half of all jobs in Japan could be performed by robots in 2035. Now, James, if they hurry up, I'm sure they can hit that link in that year that all the globalists seem to want to hit, and that's 2030, right? Exactly right. You did play the audio from that Truth Stream Media video the other day about uh, the 2030 city of the future and um, the idea of that uh, Danish parliamentarian that, hey, we're not going to own anything in 2030 and it'll be wonderful. You'll just borrow everything whenever, you know, the computer system allows you to have it. And it's uh, that's. I mean, oh my God. So anyway, this story obviously caught my eye because of my 2017 future trend prediction of the year of technocracy. And uh, there's a lot in here that I hope people will go through the whole article. It's got uh, info about Daiichi life insurance in Japan also has already uh, implemented this uh, Watson-based system to assess payments, although they haven't cut any staff members yet. And Japan Post Insurance is and is looking at introducing a similar thing. As well, AI could be so- soon be playing a role in Japan's politics. Next month, the Economy, Trade, and Industry Ministry will introduce AI on a trial basis to help civil servants draft answers for ministers during cabinet meetings and parliamentary sessions. Uh, what could go wrong? Um... And then if you click on on the sidebar, it's, it's the, there's a little link to a story. The automated city. Do we still need humans to run public services? And it's talking about the smart city of the future and all of the wonderful things that we can do to replace humans in every aspect of running cities. I mean, you, you, why do you need garbage collectors? Why do you need bus drivers? All of this sort of thing. So, um, you know, I mean, I think you can understand where that's going. And look at the little sidebar on that article. Cities, the, the section this is running in, is supported by... The Rockefeller Foundation. Surprise, surprise. And then we can flip over to a related story that was tweeted out by our uh, friend Ray Vahi. World's largest hedge fund to replace managers with artificial intelligence, in which this is uh, uh, talking about automated software that's going to be in charge of strategic decision-making, including hiring and firing. So in the future, when the AI determines that uh, you will be made redundant by future AI uh, breakthroughs, the AI will fire you. (laughs) You're going to be fired by robots to make way for robots. It is... I'm telling you, this in the next few years, this is going to get crazier and crazier, and it is going to start impacting the lives of people who are watching this and listening to my voice right now. The only question is, what do we do with this? Because as I said in the New World Next Year, uh, this could be the freeing of human productivity from the the mindless drudge labor that no one actually wants to do, and we could use this to propel ourselves into a new era of human creativity. Or the culling of the herd could begin uh, in earnest as the cattle are no longer needed by their their cattle ranchers. So, um, again, I'm not, not hopeful, especially when it's the Rockefeller Foundation and other wonderful groups like that bringing information like this to us. Well, and it makes me think of the... Makes me think of the Morlocks and the Eloys and, of course, H.G. Wells, the time machine. Um, as long as you're talking Rockefellers, of course, I think it's important to point out that it's IBM. It's IBM, the the folks who helped automate the Holocaust, at least according to Pulitzer Prize winning author Edwin Black. So we'll include the links to that. And, of course, that note about the hedge fund, Bridgewater Associates is the name of it. And we'll include the flashback link to last summer 
where we talked about white collar robots are coming for your office jobs on this very show right here, New World Next Week. We reach our cover story this week, and everybody's kind of waiting with bated breath, and we kind of want all of America's next top president to be over and done with. But it's not, and it seems like it's the gift that keeps on giving. So, James, you mentioned Truthstream Media. We were talking about the automated cities of the future. They also had a report just this Monday, and I talked about it on my Monday morning shows, pretty much what I hit the ground running with on Monday morning. Last-minute change in security at the inauguration reminiscent of JFK in Dealey Plaza. Now, that is a very grabby headline. And you start to dig through it, and you realize, okay, they're going to swap out some general. But what I found actually today when we were prepping for this show, the Washington Post originally reported that Major General Errol R. Schwartz, who has commanded the D.C. National Guard since his appointment to the position by George W. Bush, was told to vacate his office the moment Trump says his I do's to the oath of office. Then, a little bit later, news emerged that the incoming Trump administration offered to let Schwartz keep his job through Inauguration Day, but the general himself refused the offer, preferring instead to quit at 12 noon on January 20th, the hour before Trump takes his oath of office. So basically, this was the guy that Bush had on. The way this usually goes, and the way it happened before, Obama asked him, hey, Schwartz, we would like you to stay on. Schwartz said, hey, I sure would like to. This time around, it's the tradition. Trump says, hey, would you like to stay on? Schwartz said, no, I don't want it. So this is the interesting part. So it seems, again, lots of fake news gets inflated and built up. However, James, this is what we want to kind of talk about here. These are the questions. These are the the stories, and these are the memes that have kind of been planted out there, right? That's right. I mean, I think what stories like this show is what people are looking for, in a sense. Um, It's like the the pothole in the road that if you're staring at it, you're going to drive into it. There's, again, a lot of chatter and buildup and parallels. Oh, it's JFK part two. Oh, it's assassination and whatever. And all of that is swirling around. And, you know, uh, all of that is in the mix right now. And truly, I couldn't think of a worse thing that could possibly happen in in our lifetimes than an assassination of a president at this point, because the chaos that that would unleash would be unparalleled, I think, to anything that we've seen in our lifespans. Um, And the worst part about it is that clearly, I mean, at the very least, there is character assassination going on here. Um, In fact, the Washington Post, paradoxically enough, has just published uh, an article that's talking about how what the intelligence agencies are doing to Trump is like what the FBI did to MLK. So with the character assassination, Um, it's, it's strange, but the worst part about that is that it puts us into a false dialectic where, Oh, if the Intel agency, as if the Intel agencies is some monolithic thing, rather than certain people who have certain allegiances to certain other people, Anyway, that's a whole other thing that we could explode. But if the intel agencies are against Trump, then I guess he's a good guy. No, false dialectic. They want to push you into this. And I keep thinking that this this meme that they're pushing right now is exactly in 2008, Barack Obama was the perfect person to put into position to carry the football further down the field. Bush was yesterday's newspaper. He was the he was the birdcage liner that they had to take out. Replace him with the slick slick black man. It's the new face of the new world order. Hey guys, it's great. It's uh, you know Bush 2.0, but you won't notice it for a few years. And now they're putting into place somebody who's look. All of these establishment people are against him. Therefore, he's a good guy. You must you know support what he's doing. Let's repeal Obama. Care and replace it with Trump care. Individual mandate, that's socialism. Individual mandate, yay! <laughs> I mean, I, I'm telling you, this is going to be incredible to watch because it is going to be Hope and Change Part 2. Um, but his supporters won't hear any of that until it's too late, just as Obama's supporters won't hear any of that until it's too late. And the worst part is they've got us in this dialectic. If, if they're against him, he must be good. That's not the way it works. A couple of other quick things, James, as we start to wrap up this episode. I'm really interested in finding out. I don't know that the information is out there. I'm, I've been asking the question, who's the designated successor or the designated survivor? They basically pick somebody from the District of Criminals that they send away so that in case D.C. blows up, 
you've got a new dear leader hiding out somewhere. It was Robert Gates, the head of the military during one of Obama's inaugurations. That's what have, that would have been our new dear leader. So I'm interested to know who that's going to be this Friday. If anybody has that answer, I'd love to get that on the tweets. And I've actually been looking at a few of these other kind of assassination memes. Last Friday on my show, I looked at a film that Sinatra did eight years before Manchurian Candidate called Suddenly. It's public domain. It's from 1954. He plays a, an assassin who's trying to assassinate the president when he rolls through town. Something I'm going to look at this coming Friday is the forthcoming book by a guy named Antonio Viciano. And he worked under Maurice Bishop. That's CIA's David Atlee Phillips. This hits, it gets into kind of the nitty gritty of, of JFK. His new book is called Train to Kill, the CIA plots against JFK, Castro, and Shea. So we're looking at that. And James, we're looking at all the other sort of gifts that Obama's leaving for Trump as I think this is going to be kind of a seamless transition. It seems like the, you know, the bankster bailout was a seamless transition between Bush and Obama. They worked together on it. So one of the parting gifts that Obama is giving Trump is that expanded surveillance powers. Recent approval of new procedures for an existing executive order will allow the NSA to share the private data it collects with all 16 agencies of the United States intelligence community. So speaking of surveillance and given what we know, not only historically, but I don't know if you've seen those new Veritas videos and what they appear to show. James, it seems like we're going to see a new renaissance of radical leftist terror. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. probably a bunch of dupes are going to blow themselves up Bill Ayers underground style and kind of sacrifice themselves to this divide and conquer meme. Are there other things that you're kind of watching and looking out for as we start to wrap up this episode? Well, let me just comment on that Obama giving new powers to the intelligence agencies to handing them in a bow to Trump. Um, that's, that's the point. The intelligence agencies are not against Trump and Trump is not against the intelligence agencies. He's against specific people that sure, he'll probably kick in a uh, kick out once he comes into power, but he's not going to dismantle the CIA. He's not going to dismantle the NSA. These intelligence agencies are still going to be there. It's just going to be his guys in charge. And then four to eight years later, when someone else gets in power, someone you don't like, even if you are a Trump supporter, then it'll be bad again. Oh, d you know, now we have to get rid of these intelligence agencies. Same trick every single time will people ever learn that these tricks are just the same thing they're hammering you in the face with every four years. That's pretty jam-packed first New World Next Week episode for 2017, and I think hopefully to try and end on a little bit of good news, some of the things we've been talking about lately is building new things for ourselves. Unfollow Friday, D Decentralize, as you've been talking about recently. Bit shoot, as we've been unveiling recently. And my latest episode of Good News next week, the circus is leaving town as the Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus shuts down after 146 years and people make the joke, yeah, that's because the new circus is rolling into D.C. There's also good news stories about monkey wrenching the New World Order with pennies and cannabis and I just want to remind everybody out there that, James, you and I both are completely independent and crowdsourced media, and we both have Patreon accounts that are great ways to kind of keep us moving and grooving. I think we will leave it there. Jam-packed indeed. Thank you for this uh, first update of the new year. Looking forward to another year of interesting stories. Thanks, buddy. Take care.